Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to another episode of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Now, many a time in law, we come across situations where you have to have specific negotiation skills. However, if you're not equipped with the knowledge and training on how to deal with the opposition, often you'd find yourself on the losing end or receiving less than you had bargained for. And it gives me great pleasure tonight to welcome an expert in the art of persuasion, uh, in the art of how you should be able to read mind and body language, or bo body language that tells you what the mind is, is all about. And he's an international author. Uh, he's the winner. He's published a book called The Persuasion Games. He goes by the title Gilan Kork. And he has, he, this, is the, this is the title of the book, Will You Persuade or Be Persuaded? Gilan, good evening. Good evening, Ashra. Thank you for coming. It's a wonderful to be here. Gilan, I was fascinated when I read your story. That, uh, I, I think we have to start with a disclaimer, right? Yeah. Mind reading is not white magic, just forgive the pun, or black magic. It's a skill. You can get people to want to do what you want them to do, or you could get them to think like how you want them to think. Is that a correct uh, uh, summary of what a mentalist does? Yeah. Well, look, the term mentalist is actually uh, it's quite a broad term. Anyone can use that term. It's, right. uh, there are some guys who are um, fantastic at maths. They could be a mentalist. Okay. Someone who's amazing at memory, they could call themselves a mentalist. It usually has stuff to do with the mind. And for me, my particular passion is how to read and influence people. So that's a lot of body language, like you mentioned, um, psychology, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and when people see what I do, uh, if I'm presenting, if I'm demonstrating it, it could almost come across like mind reading. Yeah. But, uh, you know, absolutely, there's nothing supernatural or psychic right. or yes. anything about it. It's a learned skill. I've learned it because I've been mentored by other mentalists from the States, the UK, and so on. And uh, it's a skill that anyone can learn. If I have a gift, it's that I have a knack for it. Uh, talent for it, but anyone can learn the skills. We're well, talking about the gift. When I was reading into your background, it was fascinating. Gilad actually skipped school, nearly failed matric because he was so occupied with the with wanting to learn more about being a mentalist. I mean, that I found absolutely fascinating. That you had such a deep passion for this thing, that you 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 saturated yourself almost mm. in your books, and you nearly failed, right? Yeah, yeah. I think my my teachers probably. Uh, just because they like me, try to look for some percentages that they could scrap together. You know, I think I, I think I, I almost failed Afrikaans, uh, and I think if you failed Afrikaans, you'd fail the whole year. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, you know, I passed like one percent lower grade. I just, I had no interest in school. Um, all that I, I mean, I was performing since I was. I had my first paid booking when I was twelve. So oh. I was just absolutely absorbed in that world, and uh, and school at the time just didn't seem to me like something that had anything to do with that. If I could go back now, I would completely re rethink that. I mean, I think that uh, I would uh, probably be a little bit more balanced, but I have no regrets in how it all turned out. Um, but I mean, you're famous now, basically. Well, As thank you. That's yeah. <laughs> well, look, uh, yeah, a I mentalist mean, uh, is the stuff you see on TV. Uh, when mm. I saw there was some other program on what is a mentalist? I was fascinated. I thought it was Hollywood until I actually read your story. And I thought, this is a real live skill. There's, there's people that do this. Mm. Uh, I've seen some of your interviews. I, I know that you've lectured to large numbers of audience. So what is it that you want to achieve out of this? What, what is your end, uh, let's say, end game or end result? Look, my end result yeah. is um, just to do more of what I'm doing, just to reach more people. Right. Uh, I, uh, I, I really enjoy what I do for a few reasons. Um, the one is that I enjoy being in front of an audience. Okay. I enjoy doing things that I can see light bulbs switching on, uh, people taking notes, yes. people coming up to me afterwards saying that makes so much sense, or the next day saying, hey, I used that technique in my very next meeting and I managed to change the results of it. That's Testing. very rewarding. That's yeah. very rewarding. And so uh, the end goal of this essentially is just to 
reach as many people as possible. You know, it's the live audiences, but I'm also launching online courses because, of course, the world is a very small place now. Yeah. can reach people all over the world uh, through computers and the internet. So uh, that really is, is the end game. You know, I believe that everyone uh, has ideas that are worth attention. Yes. And so often in life, uh, the ability to influence people to buy into our ideas is even more important than the idea itself. Yes. And so that's why I'm passionate about empowering people with the ability to positively and obviously ethically influence and persuade the people around them to support their ideas and yes. so that we can all do amazing things because you need other people to be able right. to do amazing things, right? You can't do it by yourself. And one of your goals, I think, is to actually create the best possible potential in that person. Yeah. So that that person reaches the pinnacle of his own whatever gift that he, that he has. Exactly. But you've got the tools and you've trained. Uh, uh, I mean, you've been through a lot. Give us some of your background and training. So, I, I mean, I started when I was really young. Yeah. Um, when I was just a child, uh, my okay. parents always said that I'd be involved in entertainment. Um, I started, like I mentioned, when I was 12 years old, doing paid gigs. Now, they were, they were nothing like what you would see me do today. Sure. I mean, to, you know, today, 80% of my work is in teaching uh, corporates how to read and influence people in business. But back then, it was more the fun side of being a mentalist. Uh, I used to, uh, and even then, I, I don't, I'd never even called myself a mentalist. I was basically right, going around doing little tricks with people. And uh, I would work at a restaurant, for example, and I would go from table to table. And while they were waiting for their food, uh, I would entertain them. Amazing. And what was, you know, that was already preparing me to be what, what I am today because to, be, to do the exact same routine, if you want to call it that, yeah. you know, three or four specific things that I wanted, you know, experiments or feats or, with that table, is that as I would go from table to table, I would realize that, you know, if I did that the same way, but I would just pause a little bit more, then people would react this way. Or if I said it in this way or drew their attention to something in a specific way, then they would react completely differently. And so I started to learn a lot about uh, psychology and how people would start reacting predictably to certain things if I said or did certain things. If I, if I saw people using certain body language, then I knew that they were more likely to choose certain things or to think in certain ways or to respond to me in certain ways. So I really found that by repetition, Mm -hmm. And just doing the same routine, table yeah. after table after table, night after night. Eventually, I started to realize that as humans, we uh, behave in these predictable ways. And, and there's a psychologist with a fantastic book. His name is Dan Ariely, and his book is called Predictably Irrational. Have you read it? No, no. no. It's a fantastic read. And he says that as humans, we think that we behave completely unpredictably or yeah. that we uh, or irrationally or yes. and that we will respond to something or make a decision on a whim or using our logic but actually what happens if you look at the numbers is that most of us behave the same way most of the time or we respond to things the same way most of the time and so he coined this term called pre being predictably irrational to say that our rationality happens the same way again and again and again. And so this is why we can rely on things like influence psychology, body language. This is why, you know, a lot of people think that these are character traits that either you're born with or without. Yes. And yes. either you're influential or you're not. Or either right. you're good at reading people or you're not. But once you learn the way that humans are predictably irrational, then you can start to learn the skills to be able to work with that, to be able to read people better, to be able to influence them a little bit better, whether that's in your home environment, whether it's uh, uh, you know, with your family, with your friend, whether it's at work, you're trying to get a raise, you need to influence yeah, yeah. your boss, or yes. you're in a negotiation, yeah. or, a, or a, you know, an interrogation, anything like that. Um, you would be able to start to work with people a lot better and, and to increase your effectiveness with, with people. I think legally speaking, um, th these skills are very, very needed or, or highly sought after in certain areas. Negotiations. Negotiations span a huge number of legal subjects. You could be in a labor court, you could be in litigation, you could be in a mediation, you could be indeed in a matrimonial system or, uh, you know, going for counseling or whatever the case is, because now that's become compulsory in certain matrimonial matters. Mm. But I think people could definitely learn from just the basic skills. Now, how long does it take to, to train somebody? I think you've got 50 cards on 
body language, right? Oh, yes, the yeah. My Body Language Empowerment Cards. Yes, yes I saw through, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those are great. There's, there's about 50 cards, and each one has a different gesture okay. or something that you would be able to, uh, to take out and say, I'm going to look for people using this gesture and seeing what it means. So, um, you know, that shows that you can actually learn it quite quickly. But there's different layers of, of learning. Yes. Um, so let me just say that you, something like body language especially, the yeah. minute you're aware of something, you're going to start seeing it around you because everyone is using body language the whole time. I have people when they uh, see my talk on body language, years later they came up to me and they say, oh, I still remember and they'll rattle off a whole bunch of things. And that's because the minute you're aware of it, you see it everywhere. So you're always conscious of it. You're always reminded of it. So there are certain things that you're able to um, learn quite quickly. Okay. And then there are other things that take a little bit more time. But there's four different levels of, of learning. Um, and I'll use driving a car uh, okay. as, a, as an example. Yeah. Um, or let's use even just learning a, a language or learning how to write to okay. read because body language is like any language that you, that you might learn. Okay, that's uh, important. Yeah. It's, it's a, like a language, like a, a verbalized language, but it's, it's a body language. But it's body language, yeah. exactly. So um, the minute, the minute um, you, there's something that you don't know, it's at the very, very lowest level which is unconscious incompetence. Uh, uh, this would be someone who doesn't even, they're not even aware that body language exists, is, exists yeah. and they don't even know that it's a, mm. it's a thing, right? So that is the very low. But then you'll watch an interview like this and say, oh, wow, so there's body language that actually accounts for 60 to 80% of what we communicate face to face. And so suddenly you become aware of what you don't know. So you know that there's body language, but you're not actually sure what it is that you should yeah. know about it. So that is what we call conscious incompetence. Then the third level is when you actually start to learn that thing. So for example, if someone attends a masterclass or a talk or they read the book or they get the body language cards, suddenly you are consciously competent. That's the third level where you're very conscious about it. And it's like when you first learn to drive that car. Um, and you're very conscious about, got to look in the rear view mirrors. Yeah, yeah. You know, remember the K50? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And left, the, right. Yeah. Exact left, right. And then, and okay, I'm going to push the clutch in and then change the gear and slowly let it out. And so you're very, very conscious about it. And that takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus. But then once you've done it for long enough, you have what you call unconscious competence which is where now you'll drive your car from A to B and you won't even remember every time you press the sure. clutch. It's just an unconscious thing. And so it's the same with, with reading. If you had to learn a, a language, you first you learn as a, as a child, you learn uh, the shapes, circles, squares, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then that prepares you to then learn the different um, letters of the alphabet. Then you're phonetically going cat and mat and pat and whatnot, you're, you, you're slowly learning. So it's learning. practice. Exactly. It's but now you've seen that there's emails that go around with that famous, you know, where they've got a whole paragraph and all the letters are jumbled yes, up. Yes, yes. And then and you're able to read you're it. You're able to read it. So because yeah. it's unconscious competence. Mm -hmm. And body language is exactly the same thing. As you, you very, um, obviously, when you start, you can learn it quite quickly. But that highest level takes time where you can walk into a room and immediately start seeing things without having to consciously decode it. Amazing. Time for a break. Please stay tuned. Join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A reminder that you tune to Legal Ease. And tonight, a show with a slight difference. I'm hosting Gilan Gork, a mentalist. Uh, we have a live mentalist in the studio. So the lines will be open. You're welcome to call in. A fascinating topic on how to read body language and how to really persuade and get persuaded. Um, lots of skills. This is not magic of any kind. I think we've cleared that up earlier. There's not white magic or black magic. Yeah, it's a skill, right? Exactly. What I saw, interestingly enough, um, you know, before the break was an experiment that you had carried out where certain cue cards were put and you could almost, well, you did predict what the majority of the audience would choose. Now, that, that is quite important. Um, let's say in the, in the sphere of negotiations for a labor union. Every year you have unions clamoring for 
wage increases and you have employers saying absolutely not, we can't afford it, etc. until you find out from uh, the Paradise Papers that there might be money somewhere else in the world to, to pay the workers. But to come back to the point, this is an area I think critical for them to, to learn the art of negotiation because negotiations forms so much of your daily life. Body language is actually all around us but we don't even realize it. For example, your dogs and cats, they have non-verbal responses but from their body language you could actually read what they're going to be, how they're going to be reacting. Indeed, in the legal sphere, the reason that we have trials and hearings in an open court is for the presiding officer to take into account the demeanor of the witness at any stage. And he could, he could make certain observations about demeanor and how the witness came across or whether he was shuffling, uh, you know. So very, very important. But I think we're probably not very conscious about a thing called body language, which is, as you described it, a language. Yeah. And you can learn like we were talking about just before the break, how you would learn as a child a language. So with regard to the actual skills that one can learn, how would you impart those skills? How would I impart those skills to, to, to somebody, somebody wanting let's to Let's say learn? I want to learn exactly what you're teaching, how to persuade. I think you're saying, yeah. will you persuade or will you be persuaded? A reminder that this is his book. It is available online. It's available in bookstores, it's available online. Wasn't it an uh, Amazon bestseller? It was an Amazon bestseller, there so you can go. grab it on there. You can right. get it in Kindle, if okay. you like, so it's all there. Um, information, could it's all on my website and links, um, or any bookstore, like I said. Right. So look, I mean, if you're talking about um, body language specifically, I would say that the first place to start is to understand the three biggest mistakes that people make when trying to read body language. Uh, which also form the three foundations of reading body language. And I would say that um, the, the biggest amateur mistake that people make is to interpret any one given gesture in isolation. Oh, okay, like if you scratch your nose. Exactly. So, okay. so if you scratch your nose, um, this could indicate that you're feeling psychologically uncomfortable with what you're thinking and, and saying, right? So, or you uh, could just have an itch. Or you could just have an itch, yeah. right? Um, so obviously, if, when people hear certain things, so here's a very popular one, folding arms. People say, oh, if, you're, if their arms are folded, then they're just completely closed off. And, yeah, yeah. and that's actually rubbish because um, maybe it's just a really comfortable pose. You okay. know, maybe they're not really closed off, but it just depends on the change in body language. So, so firstly, let, let me finish by saying that body language is like any language, which... Um, in English, one word can have a dozen different meanings. Sure. In body language, one gesture can have a dozen different meanings. Uh, in English, you need to have at least three words put together to make a sentence that actually gives a message. Or no, no also is a... Well, no could give a message, yeah. but um, generally if you want to sure. communicate, you need yeah. at least three words. In, in a meaningful so way. So in body language, and this is just a rule of thumb, there are some exceptions that we yeah. can get into if you like, but as a rule of thumb, you want to see at least three signals, cues, or gestures okay. that communicate the same thing. And that would make it far more accurate to read someone. Um, which brings me to the, to the uh, second thing that I was saying, is that a lot of it has got to do with the change in body language. Okay. So, for example, if somebody, here's another one, people say if someone doesn't make eye contact, then they're lying. Yeah, yeah, if you're looking down or... But what if that person always is looking down? Sure. What if they have a certain psychological issue? What if they have a tick? What if they've got some kind of a, a, a habit or, a, or, you know, you'd never know. So what we always try to look at and think, what is the norm for this person? As okay. in what's normal for this person? Right. So the tick would be normal. That would be normal. Yeah. Or if you meet someone and they have, let's say they feel completely inferior, they've got certain issues, whatever it may be, and they're not making eye contact with anyone, you're not going to interpret their lack of eye contact as much as you would someone else who has good eye contact until you say, did you take the money? And then they look away kind of thing. Yeah. So, so you also, would... I think culture plays a part, right? Absolutely. Certain cultures, when you hand a gift, they would put a hand out and they'll hold it. Yes. I mean, how would you, you know, if you don't know the culture, you'd think this is very strange. Or they would open the door for the woman and step in before her. In certain cultures, that's a sign of manliness because you're taking on the danger and you're protecting the lady. Yes. In other cultures, it is, 
open the door for the lady, otherwise you're not a gentleman. So I guess that also has an impact. So your, your truth is don't judge just by a single action. Don't judge by a single action. And I would say that the point that you've just made about cultural differences is highly relevant. And that brings me to the second biggest mistake that people make, Yes. which is um, if you had to see someone, um, I'll just use the example of, close, of crossed arms again. Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, that person's closed off. But maybe it's a different type of context. Maybe there's a different situation. Perhaps they're in a cold room. Maybe you need to check the setting on the air conditioning before you go and misinterpret that gesture. And so, again, you should know what the situation is, which could include, what, you know, where does this person come from? What's normal for them? What does their culture dictate mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. And so if you consider the situation, the context of the discussion, the environment, you, the whole situation, then that might change your interpretation of the gestures or expressions sure. that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So just to recap, the first one is to always look for a set of at least three gestures, signals, cues that communicate the same thing. The second is to always consider the situation. And the third is what I call harmony. Okay. So uh, I'm not very good at music. Uh, okay. I don't play any instruments. I don't know if you do. No. No. But still, even if you're not that musically inclined, you can hear if two people are singing or there's two instruments playing and they're not in harmony with True. each other. Yes. Immediately you pick it up, you feel like there's something not right there. Yeah. Can't, I'm not an expert at music, so no, I can't quite put my finger I think it. your innate uh, ability would be able to say, look, there's something not right. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's the same with communication, with body language, is that, um, you know, if you've ever had that um, situation where you're speaking to somebody and you can't quite put your finger on it, but they're saying all the right things, but it doesn't feel right. Doesn't Should you gel, trust them? Yeah. Doesn't quite gel. In, in a business environment, in a contractual capacity, you know, when you're dealing with contracts, isn't that, that's fundamental to try and get to, to really reading the right signals to say, am I going down this contract? Am, am I going to get hurt at the end of the day? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, some people call it intuition. Yeah. I, I think that intuition is built up with uh, you know, many different little slices of experience yeah. that your mind will access in a, in a split second that gives you a, a feeling. Uh, there's all psychology behind it. Um, I actually go about it in my book, but that it counts for, uh, for body language as well, where you might not be able to quite put your finger on it, but what, what you're sensing is that their verbal communication and their nonverbal communication is not congruent, is not matching. It's not in harmony. It doesn't sound right or feel right. right together. And so when that happens, which do you think is the more, more reliable source of information? The verbal or the nonverbal? From what now you're saying, the nonverbal. The nonverbal, because yeah. it's very easy to control what you're saying. Sure, yeah. But most people are completely unaware and have no control over what it is that they're doing, unless they're highly, highly trained. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trained liars, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, you, which you can get out there, you know. I mean, even actors and actresses are trained liars sure, because I mean, they have they, to portray certain emotions when they're not really feeling it or true. get themselves into that state. But, but, but it's amazing how they influence people because you have people saying, I want to be like this man or like that guy in that show. And, you know, you emulate this particular created creature. Yeah. But, you know, uh, in a way you're being manipulated. So just to come back to the, uh, the basis of it is never judge, be aware of, of nuances, personal nuances, and see how you could use this in a different environment. Yes, yeah, so it's always look for a set of three gestures, signals, yes. cues, and more that. Um, so the best way to, re to remember this, by the way, is it actually forms an acronym of SH, as in oh, SSH. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about nonverbal communication, sure. so that's an easy way to think of it. SH, as Absolutely, in don't talk. Yeah. So the first S stands for a set. Gilad, we have a caller. Oh, sure. Caller, please go ahead. Hello? Hello, can you hear us? I think we, you can go ahead. Hello, how are you? Very good, uh, and you? Assalamu alaikum, brother Ashraf. Wa alaikum salam, brother and, and, Abdus. And, and greetings to your guests. Good evening. And, uh, I must tell you that we enjoy your program as, as usual. But uh, what I want to know is I have got uh, some experience that uh, I do not sort of 100% agree with you. 
She said, for instance, uh, as a school teacher, <coughs> as a teacher in a class, now we are have in the habit, for instance, when we teach, when we teach a student or a, in a class, what we do is that we say, right, you look at the reaction, you are talking on a certain subject and you want to watch the, the student's face and you want to say, who has understood you, who has not. And then sometimes what happens at the first time, if you do not know the students and their reaction, you find that different students, one guy was looking at you, you look at him, you say, this person has really understood everything. Then the other person is just looking one way and he does not show any emotions or reaction. Sometimes he does not even laugh at a joke. Now you find that you question that the person who was showing so much emotion as if he understood. So ask him a question he did not understand, but the guy who was quiet, who did not show any reaction, you ask him a question, you find that he has understood. So you cannot go in a class and teach and then see that by the reaction. But after a while, say you have been teaching that class for a, for a few weeks, then you would understand that this person reacts like this and that person reacts like that. So you got to understand each one's nature. And I want some comments on that. Sure. Thank you for the call. It's time for a short break. Please stay tuned. We'll come back after the break and we'll try and address that question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. But by now you would have figured out that we're not only talking law, but we're talking about skills that one can use in the legal environment. Most uh, of the law uh, is non-verbal, I would say, in the setting of a trial. For example, the presiding officer is entitled to take into account the demeanor of the witnesses as well as the complaint, I think a good example is Oscar Pistorius' trial. That was, f that was laden, I think, mm. with body language. Um, the, the being sick in the, in the, in the box, uh, you, know, you know, reacting to horrific photos of the crime scene. All of that would have been non-verbal communication of how the, the accused felt at, at any stage. Or um, the evidence given by forensic uh, scientists about the... the blows, etc., etc. I mean, those are all of that, all of that built into this human being that he's not communicating, but the mind is actually sending out a message. Your skill is, how do you read that? Yep. But Gilad, there was a question before the break. Do you want to just answer that? Sure. Well, I think that the, uh, I, I'm not so sure if it's a question so much as it is just a, a comment, a, a comment yes. or a confirmation of what we were speaking yeah. about just before. And I would say that, uh, you know, we were saying how when it comes to body language, a lot of people make the mistake to make an assumption based on, um, you know, a, a specific body language gesture. And really, you know, for example, if someone shifts their eyes away, that yeah. means that they're lying yeah, or they're yeah, not being yeah. truthful. But actually, we need to know what is the norm for a person, what's normal for them. And really, the most effective reading of body language happens when you detect changes in people's body language. And so the uh, our friend who called in, who was talking about as a teacher, yes. how sometimes you can misread a student, but after a couple of weeks, then you actually can read them a lot better, just goes to show how once you are tuned into someone, once you know what the norm is for that person, it becomes far more predictable in terms of, or reliable to be able to read them. Um, although that said, there are a lot of other standard uh, sets of gestures that if you had to see them, you could quite reliably know what someone is thinking and feeling, never mind what they're saying. But the important thing is that that becomes reliable only when you're seeing a set of uh, at least three or so gestures, cues and signals that communicate the same thing. Yes. And that's when it really becomes reliable, um, it, you know, beyond just look at, uh, knowing what someone's norms are. So I think that uh, our, our caller's experience as a teacher really goes to confirm that. Absolutely. Mm. I understand we have another caller. Caller, please go ahead. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Uh, so what I want to find out is uh, when... Okay, can we ask you to please turn down your TV? We're getting feedback. Okay. 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 Well, what I would like to find out is uh, 
uh, how would you judge a person, what state of mind is he to, to negotiate on any issues? Uh, would it, wouldn't it be then confrontational if a person is uh, not in the right state of mind? Uh, would it be confrontational? Or how, how you handle the situation? And the other question I want to ask is, when you are talking to somebody, their minds are normally dirty. And you can, I can sort of judge a person that is not uh, uh, comprehending what you are trying to get. He's going to repeat the same thing over. So how would you uh, sort of rectify those uh, issues like that? So if, so if I understand your question, the first one is, if the person is confrontational, what do you make about it? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, the question is, uh, how would you judge a person in what state of mind? Is it the right time to discuss any issue? Kila, do you understand that thing? Yeah, look, I think that um, if, if you can choose when to discuss certain issues, yes. I, I think that it's, uh, it, it is good to choose the right time. Uh, and, and I mean, I think that this is one of the uh, principles of, of influence. Uh, if I had to take just a context, let's say it's someone who works for you, uh, then perhaps it would, you know, that's an issue of leadership, you know, of having the right timing to engage with people. Um, but yes, even if someone is in a state of mind that perhaps, uh, but you still have to engage with them right now, if it's quite a pressing matter, uh, then there certainly is body language that you can use that can help to just soften the situation, diffuse it, to be able to connect with the person first so that you can then go on to have the, the rest of that negotiation in a way that might be, uh, that might just take the edge off of that, um, off of that situation or, or that person's state of mind. Does it help you? Uh, yeah, it does help. But one, one more question, uh, Mr. Bob, is uh, uh, would, you, would it be better to discuss issues that you should be prepared for? In other words, somebody may be called up uh, on, a, on a round table conference and you are not prepared for an issue that they wish to discuss. Would, you, would it be advisable to, to, to know what issue they, people want to discuss with you? Yeah, you, you mean like in? an agenda up front before you enter into a meeting? That's just common sense, yes. right? Yeah. Because it can go in any direction. Yes. Yeah, you don't need to be a mentalist to read their minds and know what they're thinking. Just ask for an agenda ahead of time. That'll, that'll help. Okay, thank you. Oh. Are you welcome? Yes, yes. Gila, you know what's interesting? In our community, when there's a marriage proposal, usually there's an entourage of people going, right? So it's not like you would see in a movie where the guy just goes down on his knees and presents a ring personally to the girl. That could come later. But what about the cues now, you know, when, when you're going with a marriage proposal, right? Because, I mean, I'm sure people would benefit from this to say, well, who am I dealing with here? What, you know, what are the cues, the body language? You said, don't take anything in isolation, take them in a setup. So that's part of getting to know who the family is, etc. But I'm sure there must be some personal crack or some, some personal gift that you can identify and and try and find out if, if, if your hunch is correct about this. Are you saying that if you want to propose to someone, yeah. you don't know if they're going to say yes or no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that if, uh, you know, if, if you're worried and you have to try to read their body language and whether they're going to say yes or no, then maybe you just need to be a little bit more sure before you, before yeah. you ask the question. Um, but, uh, you know, our minds are amazing things. Yeah. How many times in your life have you had something important that you want to ask someone? and you want the answer to be yes, yes whether yeah. it's marriage or business or anything. Yeah, yeah. And as you start asking the question, before you, you, just a few words have come out, you're already picking up all their micro gestures, their micro expressions, it's gonna be yes and already or no. you're forecasting if it's gonna be yes or no. And so, you, know, you, you're, you can pivot midway in, in the sentence and land up asking something completely different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this happens all the time you know, in social settings, in, you know, at home or in business. And so I would say that a marriage proposal is probably, probably no different. But I would say that if you're gonna propose to someone, um, you, hopefully you would be sure that they wanted that they wanted sure but I, I think on, on another level is to prevent uh, divorces you, yes. you, you know you know from that point of view is don't get into the thing to get out of it so there's a lot of you know breakdowns uh, in in marriages so mm. the question is how do you judge when you when you're going in whether you 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 know this is going to work or is it not going to work Be yeah. because this nonverbal cues is what you have to yeah. now put together and say look 
you know, does it, is, this, is this thing going to actually stand the test of time? Yeah, there's a, there's a fascinating uh, study that was done yes. where they were looking at people's micro expressions. Yeah. They had uh, couples who would come in who weren't yet married. Um, I, I think that they may have been engaged, but they weren't yet married. Sure. And they uh, had high definition cameras on them and they had also software uh, that could also analyze the, the slightest of gestures. So, um, Micro gestures or micro expressions are very, very difficult to read, but and they happen in a flash. So I'll give it's you subliminal, an, right? It's it's subliminal. It happens without us being able to control it, uh, for the most part, and um, they they're fairly reliable. But I'll give you an example of one particular micro expression. And I'll I'll bring it back to the marriage thing as well because they actually detected that couples that showed this one particular Trait. micro expression. Yeah years down the line, got divorced, sure. right? So this micro expression, I'm gonna do it, I'll, I'll do it into camera, I'll, I'll yeah, try yeah. to see if you, so uh, it's gonna go very, very quickly, right? Here it goes. I don't know, did you see that? Yeah. Did you see, I was saw just your my lip just, yeah. just, it was a twitch. Well, was before a that, I saw you swallow hard and then the twitch. Yeah, so the swallowing had nothing to do with it. Oh, okay. Uh, that was probably me just thinking, okay, <laughs> let me do this right. I, and I even exaggerated it a little bit yeah, just sure. so that you just... can see on TV. So that little kind of <laughs> smile, it's like a little half smile and it's very quick. Yeah. What do you think that that might mean? If you're speaking to somebody, I'll give you some context. Let's say that it's in business and you tell someone what your plans are, and they suddenly give that little twitch, little twitch, and they say, oh, well, I think that that's a great, that's a great plan, you should do that. What do you think that that could mean? For me, the untrained mentalist, I would say a positive thing because he says, mm, okay, or it could be uh, no, no interest, and he's just smirking at it, and um, so it could go either way, but, for me, I, I would I would think positively. That, right. So yeah. a lot of a lot of people think that. Yeah. Because it, it kind of resembles a smile. A smile yeah. But of course, a genuine smile is something completely different when you're smiling, and there's all kinds right. of muscles that pull in when you have a genuine smile when you are happy. But that little flicker of, of the side of one of your uh, uh, one of the sides of your lips yeah. actually indicates contempt. Mm. And so, if what they found was doing this with tons of engaged couples is that when they watched the couples engaging, the couples that showed contempt for each other landed up with the highest divorce rate. That's an incredible skill to import if we don't have it here already, just to save the marriages. Yeah, yeah. The other, I think I've seen this experiment amongst politicians and they, they brought it, they froze it down to the microsecond. And in fact, some of the politicians' facial expressions showed a snarl. And it really became quite different from seeing this human being. But it gave the interpretation that they were either going to go to war or going to do something evil. Hmm. And then they said that, look, this is a study into body language. Now, interestingly, you wanted to do something, uh, you wanted to do an experiment. Uh, yeah, let, let's, let's try a little experiment. Uh, knowing that you, uh, you help to uphold the law, you know, yeah. in the country, let's, um, I thought we'll try something that's actually based on a game okay. that I used to really enjoy as a, as a child. And it was a murder mystery game. Okay. Uh, people may remember it. The game is Cluedo or yeah, Clue. Yeah, I you remember, remember that Clues, game? Yeah. People remember that, you know, it was a board game, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, where you had to work out who killed who with which weapon. Yeah. Which one, was it Miss Scarlet with the gun in the library? Yes, you know? yes. And so you would win this game by, um, no, by determining what was the secret information that was in the envelope. And the way that you, I would try to work it out when I was a child is I'd try and read my friend's body language and obviously their psychology and everything to try and figure out what was it that they were holding in their hands and then to determine what was in the... So, so wouldn't you use that in, in the card games or whatever they, they play now, the, this bridge or something? I don't know what the kids play. Yeah, blackjack, poker. Yeah. Poker, yeah, poker, poker, they walk yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't play much. It's mainly because people won't play with me. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, uh, so I thought it might be fun for us to try yeah. a little experiment where uh, I actually brought some of the cards that um, from the game that I used to play, the set that I used to play with as a child, and so let me, uh, let me hold it up here. And uh, so if, if you used to play this game, people remember these, uh, 
these weapons over here. So uh, there was a knife. Right. Um, there's a, a, a candlestick. The okay. candlestick, I think, was probably one of the favorites. Everyone remembers the candlestick. Agatha Christie, almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we had the lead pipe. Okay. The uh, rope. Yeah. And the gun. Okay. Uh, there was one more, which was the wrench, but uh, I couldn't find that one. Obviously, okay. got lost over the years. Uh, but we got five of the uh, of the weapons here, and here's what's going to happen. I'm I'm going to turn away so that I'm I'm not looking, and all that I want you to do is to take one of the cards one of the weapons, you can put the rest underneath the book there, or you can put it in your pocket, whatever you want. But whichever weapon you want to choose, I want you to just go like this, hold it in your hands like this, uh, obviously so no one can see from any angle what it is, and then uh, I'll turn around. You'll and try then, and read my I'm mind. I'm gonna try and read your body language, but it's really important that you also just relax your shoulders, it all makes sense, and you're just gonna hold that sandwich in your hand like that okay. when you're done. So go ahead, I'll uh, turn around, Ditch. so you guys can see that I'm not, uh, not cheating, I'll steer into the corner here while you're choosing one of your one of your weapons. And the rest put them away so it's out of sight. Obviously there's no way that okay, I can I'm ready and just for hold you. a sandwich in your hands. So obviously I don't want to see what it is when I turn around. Can I turn around now? Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So um, let me uh, face a little bit forward, face towards me over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just gonna take your pulse over here. And I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, knife. Knife. Say candlestick. Candlestick. Say lead pipe. Lead pipe. Rope. Rope. Gun. Gun. Say rope again. Rope. Lead pipe. Lead pipe. Candlestick. Candlestick. Say candlestick again. Candlestick. Say knife. Knife. Okay, so there's three things that I've picked up from you here. Okay. Firstly, I was taking your pulse, but that was also just a decoy to make you think that that was the main thing I was looking for, which makes you relax a little bit okay. and, uh, and give away other things. I was taking your pulse, but that's not what gave away what you're thinking. Let me tell you first what, what gave away, and hopefully I'm right, I could, I could be wrong. Um, firstly, you blinked a little bit longer on one of them when we started going backwards, right? Okay. There was one that you blinked a little bit longer. There was one that you held your breath a little bit longer. And the other thing that you cannot control at all, which I wanted to see a few times, was your pupils. Mm. When you focus on something, your pupils will constrict. They'll become mm. smaller. All right. And the weapon that every time you said it, or every time I said it, you gave off one of those signals, was the candlestick. Is that the one that you're holding? The candlestick. It is the candlestick. Wow. You know what's weird? I thought I'd cho chosen the lead pipe. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely you incredible. Thought you, you thought you chose the lead pipe. And it was a candlestick. And it was the candlestick. I said, you got it wrong, but when I looked, it's amazing. Well, then you're very polite because most people would say you're wrong. <laughs> no, I thought I'd chosen something. Anyway, really? that's quite incredible. That's quite something, I must say. But um, it's interesting in a, in a business perspective because um, polygraphs are not admissible in court. Mm. Body language testing might be something that an employer could possibly use to find out if there's a real dispute between him and the employee. So um, <laughs> I, I think you've got something really serious to, to impart. Hmm. Uh, and I'm hoping that the viewers will take uh, full advantage of it. But there's your cards. Yeah, thanks. Time for a short break on a very interesting note. Join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. I'm sure by now you are equally fascinated with the skills of my guest, Gilan Kork, who is a mentalist. It's not by profession, it's by choice. This is his passion. Just before the break, he carried out an experiment. I must tell you, I'm pretty surprised because I thought I'd chosen another card, but what he called 
was the card that I actually had in my hand, even unknown to myself. So there you have it, a tremendous amount of skill to impart. Gillen, just we have uh, the last few minutes of the show, probably 10 minutes or less, in the absence of any callers. Uh, in, in terms of the legal context, we, we've tried to unpack where this will be a skill that one can use. The art of cross-examination, the art of mediation, conciliation, arbitration, is to read the body language of the other side and try, try and perhaps see where's the, where's the high water mark for breakage. You know, are they really going to stick or are they open to negotiations and try, especially in mediation. The mediator doesn't give the solutions to the parties. He suggests to them various scenarios and he encourages them to reach a solution with themselves. But I'm sure a skill like this would be tremendously useful mm. in that particular uh, scenario. Where else would you use it in the boardroom, obviously, when, when there are partner meetings or oppositions? Mm. Yeah. Where else uniquely have you seen this? Well, body language is really relevant in all areas of our lives, whether sure. you're having a, a meeting in the boardroom, whether it's a negotiation, whether you're in sales. In sales is very important, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. What, what was the famous book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence Dale People? Dale Carnegie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for sure, you know, uh, sale is, is all about connecting with somebody. They, obviously, you want them to like you. You yeah. want them to trust you. Sure. You want them to uh, give you the business. You know, you want to uh, obviously be someone who's going to offer a solution to them and they have to believe you. So everything that you say, um, you know, needs to be your, your nonverbal and your verbal has to be in harmony, like we said earlier. So to learn certain skills, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, and in fact, this example that I'm about to uh, uh, give you will also demonstrate how 60 to 80% of a message face to face uh, is actually carried through nonverbal communication. So I'm going to say something to you, and in fact, I'll include everyone uh, sure. at, at home as well. Mm. So I'll do this in two parts. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say something, um, and I'm going to gesture with my palms facing up. Okay? okay. So I'll start with you, and then I'll move on to uh, everyone watching at home. So I'd like for you to help with the committee today, and I'd like for you to help with the committee tomorrow. Now, how did you feel about that? Neutral. It's cool. Mm. Nothing much, right? Mm. Now, I'm going to say exactly the same thing in exactly the same way, but this time I'm going to make one small change, which is that I'm going to say it with my palms facing down. So, um, I'd like for you to help with the committee today, and I'd like for you to help with the committee tomorrow. Now, did you feel that change? Yeah. Most people will say the second time around they feel more like they're receiving orders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so let's not even begin to say what happens when the finger comes out, right? Yes. I mean, you know, and maybe yeah. you are the person with the finger, right? But at the minute that happens, people become defensive. You know, I know if I'm speaking to an audience and I'm constantly jabbing my finger at them, that they could actually retain up to 63% less of what it is that I'm saying. So um, really, this shows that, I mean, I said the same thing in the same way. All I did was just do that. And a whole different message is being communicated. Especially if you're a teacher, I suppose. If you're a teacher, if absolutely. You... So, the, so if you're in a, a sales environment, for example, what you want to do when you speak to people is to speak to them with your palms facing up. Because research has shown that when I use this gesture while I'm talking to you, I'll come across as being more transparent, relaxed, easy to get along with, open. Mm. So I, I do this experiment in my, in my talks where I get the entire audience to repeat something. In fact, I'll be interested to see if it works with you now. Mm. I'm going to ask you to say something. Yeah. And I want you to say it with as much sincerity okay. and uh, charisma as you can. Okay. And I want you to use the first gesture that comes naturally to you using your hands. So okay. it's important that you use your hands uh, emphatically when you, okay. when you do this. And what you're going to say is, Gilan, I promise it wasn't me. Gilan, I promise it wasn't me. All right, but me. I want you to use both your hands and okay. I want you to say really, you know, convincingly. Convincingly, I, Gilan, I promise it wasn't me, and make a big gesture. Here we go. Gilan, I promise it wasn't me. Okay, so you went, Gilan, I promise it wasn't me. Yeah. Right? What? Why do you think you use that? For emphasis. To emphasize the point. Right? Yeah. This is really interesting because uh, if you look at Donald Trump, he uses a lot of gestures for emphasis where he's okay. jabbing. 
yeah. where he's actually poking. So you're also using that similar type okay. of thing. Now, 90% of the people in an audience when I do this will use one of two gestures. They'll go, I promise it wasn't me. Or they'll say, I promise it wasn't me. Oh, so it's that or that? It's either that, promise it wasn't me, or promise it wasn't me. And what's the commonality? What's the common denominator? Open, open, open palms. palms, yeah. So generally, if you're going to be open and honest with someone, you're programmed that you'd reveal your palms. Or okay. conversely, it's very difficult to reveal your palms if you're being deceitful to people. Sure. So this palms open gesture, similarly with what we were saying before, is that when you speak to people, either one-on-one, -on -one, across a boardroom table, uh, from a platform, if you're revealing your palms, that's when people, that's when you come across as most believable, open, honest, easy to get along with, sincere. And so I would say that something like that would be very useful if you're selling to somebody. Absolutely. Or if you're in a negotiation, whatever the case may be. You know, I was at a computer retailer, I won't mention any names. This was a couple of years ago when I bought a computer at the time, it was a new laptop. And uh, I remember asking if I could have a discount. Yeah. And immediately, now remember I said you always have to look for a set of at least three gestures. Yes, to yes. Use a signal. Yeah. But one of the set is that the guy, the manager who was speaking to me, the minute I said, is it possible to get a discount on this computer? Immediately his eyes diverted, whereas the whole time he had had excellent eye contact with me. And his hands went into his back pockets. Oh. So he was talking quite openly with me. Then suddenly he Withdrew. concealed his palms. Right, right, right. While he said to me, I'm sorry, Mr. Gork, but our system doesn't allow it. And I love that. Our system doesn't allow it. Just kind of You should buy it the Oriental right? Plaza, actually. <laughs> Dylan, we've run out of time. Okay, cool. But just, just finish that point. Well, essentially, long story short, I managed to get, I knew to pursue it and I landed up getting a discount because I was looking at his palms. Okay. So I would say that body language in all of those situations uh, is extremely relevant. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here tonight. Likewise. And thank you to the viewers. Don't forget to join us for another episode of Legal Ease next week at the same time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.